everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our third in-session panel discussion. I'm Laura Thompson, Director of Education at Mass MoCA. And uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the in-session that we're having here tonight. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to just say that this is organized in collaboration uh, with the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, better known as MCLA where we've joined forces to design panel discussions to be held with community members, artists, and museum and art professionals with a lens on anti-racism work in the arts. We kicked off the program with an artist panel in December, uh, building off of our work with Sean Leonardo, whose exhibition, Breath of Empty Space, was on view in Mass MoCA and has now since moved to the Bronx Museum of Art. Our second panel was with museum leaders, and today's panel is focused on artist residencies. Artist residencies are core to Mass MoCA's mission to, quote, help artists and their supporters create and show important new work. We define residencies in many ways. Our visual arts department hosts artists to create new work specifically for our exhibitions. Our Assets for Artists program has a rigid, uh, rigorous residency program for visual artists. In education, through our teaching residency program, we connect Mass MoCA's exhibition, uh, exhibiting artists to our local K-12 student population. And while a performing arts department has always organized residencies with performers, during the pandemic, we have pivoted to make these residencies the priority of our performing arts programming. For this panel, we invited artists and residency leaders who represent a variety of residency opportunities from those that are organized as part of an institution, college, or university to those that are standalone residency programs. And as I was on the tech call earlier this week with the panelists, I can assure you that this will be a lively discussion about the significance of these programs in BIPOC artist communities. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my co-curator of these panels, Erica Wall, who is the director of MCLA's Berkshire Cultural Resource Center and its Gallery 51. Um, so thank you for your wisdom in helping to shape the program. And thank you to the panelists who will be speaking today from their homes in New York City, North Adams, Massachusetts, Cleveland, Ohio, Troy, New York, West Medford, Massachusetts, and Santa Ana, California. We appreciate your openness to sharing your thinking about the current state of affairs of artist residencies. Thank you to Billy Sanders for interpreting tonight. And a huge thank you to Carmen Lane for moderating this panel and for co-sponsoring it through Atonset, a socially engaged artist-run urban retreat, residency and exhibition space in Cleveland, Ohio. So on to you, Carmen. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just wanna invite the audience to think about how they want to take in this panel as they will be in conversation with each other in their various stances. So we wanna invite a Q&A through Mass MoCA that supports and adds on to the conversation that's happening in real time, that it tracks back to their practice, to their stance, to their belief systems, that these questions join even in a divergent point of view to encourage us expanding and building on our ideas and the potentiality of this conversation. To begin, I want to invite Sarah Workna to bring their voice into the room and to invite others to introduce themselves and how they're engaging at the edges of art, equity, and artist residencies. Sorry. All right, no matter how many of these I do, I always forget to unmute myself. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Laura and Carmen, for the invitation. Um, my name is Sarah Workna. I'm a co-director of Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, where I've been for the last 11 years. Our campus is physically located in central rural Maine 
prior to running Skowhegan, I was the Associate Director of Oxbow School of Art and Artist Residency, which is located in rural West Michigan, where I was for eight years. Um, I'm going to just begin with how I personally approach my work, context of Skowhegan and Oxbow. Um, and I came to it, uh, which now at 20 years is, is the entirety of my adult work experience from a background in social movement theory and the study of nonviolent revolutionary movements. And in particular, thinking, how, thinking about how alternative models of education can support liberatory thinking and social change. Um, as a female identified first generation black person, my work and my ideas have been shaped by my own history and the limitations and dangers that have affected my community and others who have been marginalized, but also in the limitations of the vision of those with power. Um, I started working in art because I was interested in modalities that were rooted in challenging existing knowledge and prioritizing ideas that push the boundaries of what we think we know to envision things that haven't yet been seen or described. I've been interested in rural educational spaces in particular, um, that through space support and push forward non-hierarchical modes of co-education and access, generosity and care, um, but also as spaces that can support and challenge existing ways of engaging. Um, I consider it my job to create the conditions surrounding equity and more importantly, uh, potentiality and value and voice for others so that they can see and create that space for themselves within their creative practices and for, the, for others. Um, Skowhegan itself has existed as a forward-thinking alternative educational space that's been, you know, kind of remarkably integrated since it first opened in 1946, um, which was exceedingly rare at that point, um, but also in its location being outside of a city center in allowing different ways of relating and allowing a disconnect from previous ways of operating. And Oxbow is kind of similar in some ways. Um, I'd say that the work that I've done in each of these institutions, which are autonomous, and that's kind of intentional in terms of how I engage, um, has been not only to promote these kinds of ideas, but also to understand the ways in which institutions have barriers to all of these processes, but in fact can be re-envisioned and also have an extreme responsibility to promote care and access and offer the tools and support needed um, when you ask individuals of different histories, vocabularies, materialities, racial and gender identities, experiences, traumas, economics, all of the things that make us humans to engage with each other and contribute to each other's knowledges about the world. Um, I want to be sure to say that this work is artist-centered, but it's also human-centered and world-building centered and practice centered and really affects how each artist understands their own capacity and their content and their power and their relationships with others. Um, so I will stop there and invite Ashley Farrow Murray to introduce themselves. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be here with you all. My name is Ashley Farrow Murray, and I'm the curator of theater and dance at the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, more commonly known as MPAC, um, which is a residency and development center, also a performance and production space of four theaters located on the campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in um, Troy, New York, what is now called Troy, New York, um, also the land of the Mohican people. Um, and yeah, I mean, MPAC is a really um, interesting interdisciplinary space. We have three different artistic programs. Um, and I really want to mention that I work alongside two other incredible curators, Vic Brooks and Leila Hua Lanzalotti, who represent our time-based visual arts program and our music program. And so it's kind of an experiment in interdisciplinarity. Um, I've approached this work um, from the perspective of performance studies with specifically a dance training. So I bring a little bit of a different perspective to the conversation coming from a more traditionally performing arts background. However, working very much alongside curators who place work within museum contexts and myself also working with artists who place work within museum contexts. 
And um, because the focus of our center is technology-based and I'm coming from a sort of performance studies background, um, I did PhD research in performance studies at UC Berkeley where I focused on the histories of the relationship between technology and dance. So I'm very interested in the ways that the histories of arts have been written from specifically a kind of, um, you know, white Eurocentrist, often masculinist perspective, especially within our field of technology and art. And um, those histories definitely don't represent the actual work that was happening, but they have been written as such. And so a lot of the work that my colleagues and I strive to do at MPAC is to recenter and break open those histories. Um, that brings us into conversations um, deeply rooted within anti-racist practices and also the acknowledgement that our institution is deeply rooted within um, a kind of, you know, white supremacist narrative, historical narrative and presentist narrative um, that we're constantly trying to address and bring forward as we also open the program up um, to be able to consider more definitions of what technology means in art and to rehistoricize and re-problematize the histories of the work that we've been doing. Um, a very body-centered approach, as Sarah said, a very artist-centered approach, um, and also with a particular eye toward our staff and the deep relationships between staff, artist, curator within a residency focused program like ours. And with that, um, Bashiso, I'd love to pass to you. Thank you, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here in the space with you all. Um, I took a little bit of a different approach, which is not unheard of. Um, so bear with me a little bit. Um, so I will begin here. My name is Odeo Lodum. My name is Bashizo. I am born from Catherine, who was born from Grace, who was born from Essie May. I am Omo Ochosi and Ati Yangsan. I'm a visitor who resides in the land now known as West Medford. I'm able to enter into this virtual space and conversation because of the brilliant and generous work of those who came before me whose names I know and who I don't know. I'm also here because of my current collaborators in Unbound Bodies and Create Well, as well as all those who will come after me. I am one of three co-tending designers who is organizing a BIPOC residency called Converging Liberations at Mass MoCA this summer. All the guys be willing. I enter this space and conversation like I do my creative practice from a position of care and refusal. This approach centralizes care, collective dreaming, and healing for those impacted by violent and normative systems and structures of oppression. And for those who want to revive and reimagine and try to create less harmful ways of being, relating to one another, to the land. While also refusing the myths, trappings, and familiarity of anti-Blackness, white supremacy, and transphobia as well as the host of all the other articulations of racialized, gendered, economic, and able-bodied structures and systems of violence and oppression imposed upon Black, Indigenous people of color bodies. I enter this conversation as a Black, queer, trans, non-binary creative committed to the necessary, nuanced, difficult, vulnerable, and messy generative work of liberation, personal, communal, and social. I'm here because I yearn for more than a cursory conversation around equity in the arts and in residencies. And cursory by the fact that it'll end as soon as it's no longer in style. It'll end as soon as it's a little too uncomfortable, a little too dirty and too messy and or no longer a moniker of social justice or relevance. I enter into this conversation tonight with you all hoping that we can collectively conjure a better way to be in relationship to our practice, to be in relationship to our land and this land and these lands and to our body. And I look forward to our conversation. 
I'm gonna pass it graciously to Erica Wall with whom if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Bashizo. And um, I'm honored to go after you. I think you have said it all, but I'll try to contribute something of worth to uh, the conversation. I am Eric Wall, and I am the director of the Berkshire Cultural Resource Center here at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. And I have the pleasure to um, be a co-organizer of the in-session program with uh, Laura Thompson and Mass Mocha. And um, it is a pleasure to be able to participate on this side this evening to talk about something that is exceptionally important to me that I have grown to become quite committed to. I'll kind of work backwards for me as I land in this space um, in an academic context, I started out in art museums and I started out as an art educator. And through that work, I appreciated most the privilege I had to work in those spaces, but then I was able to recognize um, what had been sorely omitted and the work that I was put in place to do was to try and create those spaces when there was nothing in there to put for folks that looked like me. So I realized that the work that I was doing, um, it would be a continual challenge for me. And so though I was committed to the education, um, I decided that I would leave that space to see if I could commit to working with contemporary artists in a proactive way in hopes that one day I could help them find a place into those institutions in which I worked. Um, I decided to work in um, the commercial world and open a gallery in hopes that I could support artists who came from, who come from historically marginalized groups. And in that work, I realized that it was now a part of this work to make sure that the artists that I work with had the resources and means they needed to sustain a career so that we could see them to this place that I had hoped that they could be in. And um, that's where I uh, realized that residencies played a large part in sustaining um, spaces for our artists beyond what we may traditionally recognize or think of as a residency. And so in doing that work, I started a residency along with my gallery and the residency was in North Adams, Massachusetts, which led me to this job here in which I could actually extend that work to this institution. Uh, this last year, we had our um, inaugural artist, Genevieve Gagnard, be our first artist laboratory resident at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, which was an amazing experience because it is now another platform for an artist from a historically marginalized group to not just share with us um, her experience and her practice, but also serve as an exemplar to artists who come from historically marginalized groups to have someone that they can look to and see as not just um, a exemplar, but actually a resource a partner and um, someone with which they can have access to. And so for me, I come to this um, with a great deal of commitment, but a lot of trust that what I create is artist centered and that when we, couple these sorts of experiences with an institution that we serve the artist and the institution, but we always recognize that these offerings are really an opportunity for us as an institution to do the work, to understand and illuminate for ourselves what we need to do to be more inclusive and to create the broadest representation of the art world possible for those within our institution and outside of it and the community. But most importantly, that we create something that sustains these relationships and these understandings. And residencies have an opportunity for us to do this, to really approach and understand what it means to be equitable and understand that race is always, it is always an issue, it is always going to be something that we must deal with, but we have to create places which were which are safe enough for us to have these conversations. And so I I trust a lot in, in what these places can be and what they can grow to be. And I have a lot of expectations for them, but with an understanding that there are challenges that 
come with it that are historically planted in the system in which we all have to exist. So for me, it is something that I think in all those roles that I played, even as a mother, this is something that I hope that changes the way in which we have a place for artists that my children will see it in a different way and that art history will look very different than it did for me when I was in school. And so um, that is the way that I come to residencies, art, education, and the art world. And I will now hand it over to um, my dear friend, John Spiak. Thank you, Erica. And thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel. And thank you, Carmen and Laura, for all you've done in organizing this today. Um, my name is John Spiak, and I'm the director and chief curator at Cal State Fullerton's Grand Central Art Center. And our institution is actually located in downtown Santa Ana, California. Uh, I come to the arts through my background in sociology and anthropology, cultural anthropology. Uh, and beginning in the museum field, in 1994 at Arizona State University Art Museum. Uh, and I worked there for 17 years as we hosted artists at first as they developed exhibitions. And then we realized a, a residency program in 2005 called Social Studies uh, that was looking at socially engaged projects and communities uh, of diversity through the institution, um, trying to break that barrier of the walls of the institution into community. Uh, and we did projects that explored issues that were taking place in the community directly in Phoenix, which you know, is heavy with issues. Uh, and one of uh, the prime examples was a project we did with artist Gregory Sale called It's Not Just Black and White, which took on the topic of incarceration um, where Phoenix at the time was incarcerating more people per capita than any other location in the United States, 33,000 people per year. Um, and the closest was Boston at that time, which was 16,000. So we did, uh, 52 programs in three months through the residency in the museum. We brought currently incarcerated adults and youth into the museum. Uh, we brought the daughters of incarcerated women into the museum and did choreography with them and with their mothers that were currently incarcerated. And we were able to join them together so they could dance for and with one another. We brought controversial Sheriff Joe Pio into the museum and we're able to have a three hour discussion about policy because he was the one that was making policy. Um, but five days later, we brought Angela Davis out to talk about the industrial prison complex, and we brought Barry Sheck out for the Innocence Project. So the space was really an open forum for conversations. Uh, talking about how the institution performs as well, um, it was with grad students, with uh, educators, with the staff of the museum, uh, when the individuals um, that would have leave from their incarceration would come to the museum and work with us we were all working together. So the, the guards were working, the inmates were working, the students were working, the team of the museum was working all together. We shared meals together and we had experiences together and, and learned that we're all human in, in the similar ways uh, and the deep impacts it has not just on those individuals but their families and beyond on our community as a whole. In, I, in 2011, I joined the Grand Central Art Center as the director and chief curator. And from that point forward, we have really tried to expand what the residency program can be, where there were limited time constraints on the ASU Art Museum ones. I wanted to break that down and really be about projects. So uh, Grand Central Art Center kind of strives to provide opportunities for individuals and communities to bring even stronger connections, understanding and equity through the exploration of engaged contemporary art practices. Um, as we move forward post COVID crisis, and we will continue to invite artists of diverse backgrounds that challenge and expand our institutional thinking and work to support their process of discovery and research to the very best of our abilities. Uh, the openness will continue to be crucial to our approach, uh, letting exploration happen more flex in, in a more flexible process, uh, one that allows the journey to occur more organically and outcomes to evolve from passion rather than pre-proposed uh, project descriptions or um, predetermined deadlines. So no timelines for those projects, or we don't ask for a proposal up front. We really want it to be you engaging with the community and understanding where you are and um, what that possibilities could be. Uh, we want it to be a fluid and porous project. So we really thrive on discoveries, research risk, and building personal bonds through opportunities of bringing individuals together um, for lasting relationships. 
So with that, I think I'm throwing it back to Carmen. I just wanna thank the group for how you have entered this conversation with each other. And I want you all as a group to think about all the ways in which you chose to enter and introduce yourself to the audience. One of the themes that I have kind of picked up on how we are all speaking about this is the phrase um, artist centered, you know, um, and also the phrase human centered. Um, so one of the questions from the community of listeners is, well, what do we mean by that? So are we talking about design thinking, you know, design principles? So I want to encourage us in this conversation about kind of race, equity, artist residencies to really think about what we mean when we use these words um, and to invite uh, you to share your understanding and meaning making around things like human centered, around racism, around inclusion. Um, and so now I'm, I'm turning it back to you. What are you hearing from each other and how do you wanna to respond to one another? Well, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I feel the, the concept of artist-centered is so important because I think that's often a fear that that is going to be lost in the process somewhere or that we've shifted in some way. That at any point is the, is the residency itself more important than the experience for the artist? Is the residency about the artist or is it about the experience for the artist and what's provided for them versus what it allows them to do? And I often find myself um, wondering that and always trying to figure out what the balance is because oftentimes when we invite artists to come to a residency, we want to provide them with something, but in return, there's always something um, as an institution that we want. And for us, it's for them to share their practice with our community and with our students, which requires a certain amount of labor, um, whether that be through public programming or an exhibition, but always trying to keep in mind um, the balance for that. And that this is about the residency and defining that. So I don't really know if I have an answer for that, but that's what always strikes me that I'm always trying to keep that in mind. And I'm sure for artists, they're trying to consider that for themselves too. Is it really is it really about them for them? All of those certain kind of factors when they weigh out um, whether or not to to engage in a residency. I can also just add to that. I think you know, Skowhegan is kind of a different experience because artists' time at Skowhegan is really about being in the studio and being with each other. And I think when I, many ways, when I think about artist centered, I think about it as kind of like artist versus the object, right? And so in some ways the focus for, for them is really, uh, what are the ways in which we support their process of working out things within the work, work with, by like who they're interacting with, all of the ideas and things that go into what an artist is going to make. The make part for us is kind of the, the secondary. It's, it's the, the opportunity to think about what you are interested in, to have conversations about what you're interested in with other people that are similar or different. Um, so in that, that's just another way to think about artist-centered too. It's, it, it's less kind of object or obligation based in a different way. I wonder, I, um, it's interesting because I come from the performing arts, the relationship between the artist and the object is really different because the artist is often the object, right? Um, and so when I think of artist-centered, um, I, I often interchange the word artist and project also because sometimes if, even if we're working with one artist, the needs change and shift from project to project. Um, and so oftentimes it's like meeting that artist where they're at in that moment and with a certain project. And I think of it as artist in relation to institution. How can the institution support the artist? 
um, in the in the context of this conversation, I've been thinking a lot, you know, it's kind of titled in terms of race equity and artist residencies. I'm a white woman curator who's working on a predominantly white staff and working with a lot of QT BIPOC artists. And, you know, I really don't think that equity is, is possible within our institution in this context. Um, and so being aware of that fact and centering it and shifting our focus from the institution to the artist, not placing the burden of the labor of anti-racism within our institution on that artist and instead trying to figure out how we can recenter things and how our institution in all of its um, failings <laughs> can still create space for individuals and their work. And especially at impact, that's not necessarily a human-centered practice. Um, thinking very much along the lines of post-humanist practices, um, finding space for animals and insects and the earth and the land, um, finding room for machines and robots, um, Afrofuturism, Black pessimism, um, and, and really kind of uh, problematizing uh, a humanist approach to the work. Yeah, thank you. Oh. No, I, I just wanted to just add for a moment that when we think about these institutions, um, these containers are microcosms, right? So the world out there for the artist is still the world in here for the artist, for the BIPOC artist, Bashizo. Yeah, I think that leads in nicely to what I was going to say. I think for me, like an artist-centered, um, residency or approach really does have to be not only like informed by artists, the one who's actually coming, but also like the community to which their the land is on, um, how it's designed, what folks need, um, how to maneuver and navigate space, especially if that space is not, uh, is a primarily white space um, in the woods, I think that kind of like the human centered piece is is there but in relationship to right to nature to our winged siblings our other legged siblings and in relationship to our other like ways of being mm, in communion with one another and with the land and with our work um and that it is impossible in my understanding of things um, for equity to really be achieved if we're trying to do this within an institutional setting that struggles with um, actually making things more inclusive and equitable within, within the organization. And if, if all of the work is exterior, meaning like who's who's still funding who's still running the organization if those are non bipoc folks non qt bipoc folks then there will always be a rub and 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 if like artists and bipoc and qt bipoc artists aren't directly involved with the imagining and the reimagining of like how we need as creative beings to be in space and to be nourished in space in our practice with one another then then, it, then, then, then the task is even, even more difficult to achieve. Um, and so while I do agree, like, I think we do need to pivot, but I think we need to like continue to pivot, like that it doesn't just end with artist centered, but like really then does become that. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to back you up on that and say that, you know, I mean, I think we all know in the world that buildings themselves aren't neutral, food isn't neutral, exactly. and if like all of the environmental conditions that surround us actually impact our bodies and what we, if you sleep well, if you don't sleep well, I mean, Skowhegan's a residential program, so sleeping is like a big part of what we think about or like, <laughs> you know, how bathrooms are designed. There's all of these things actually need to kind of be reconsidered as part of how we understand not only just how an individual feels in space, but how you think about creating space for togetherness too, right? Like what are the kinds of things that you're trying to encourage? What kind of 
um, neutrality, like not neutrality, but like evenness within a within a physical space that doesn't create all of these separate air have to constantly be super aware of their body or their history so that they can enter a space and they can kind of think in a different way. And I think that's really important for all of these institutions because they all come from the same history that have also contributed to, to all of the problems for individuals and individuals that are covered in that, that acronym. I'd also like to say that just because a project is called Artist Center, a lot of times institutions bring their weight of an agenda to that project uh, to solve the institutional problem. Um, you know, at that time there was a lot of socially engaged projects going on, and then you find out that they, you know, the artists were brought in for wayfinding issues or to serve a more diverse audience or a younger audience or you know, they ran out of money for a landscape architect, so they have a big grass area, and now they have to bring the artists in to engage that area. So where it seems like, oh, there's these great opportunities for the artists, a lot of times there's an agenda from the institution to solve the problem of the institution instead of allowing the artist to create the problems that the institution then has to address and focus on and, um, and adjust to and um, and listen to so that it grows as an institution and as a, and as a facilitator and a true supporter of artistic practice. I'm curious if we're doing it right now, even in the ways that we're talking about these environments we want to create for artists. Can you, can you clarify that a little bit? What do, Go so deeper into of, that, Carmen. So one of the things I was hearing was right, like, you know, we want to create these ecosystems for artists to have these experiences that are welcoming. And but what does the artist want in their experience at the residency? And what do you need to do, or what do I need to do to create those conditions for the artist's entry? I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes I think about even in our desire for equity, that we're creating a tighter container that isn't artist-centered, but it's our feelings are being centered about what we want. Bishizo, Sarah, go. Sarah, go ahead. I'll go after you. Uh oh. Are you frozen? Oh, well, I guess I'll go. Um, <laughs> there will, there will return. It's okay. I, uh, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think part of why I'm interested in, in, art making and artists and this kind of particular way of thinking is also not having predetermined ends, right? And thinking about how that actually relates to liberation and things like that. And for me in my job, it really also relates to how I listen to the individuals that are around me. And as they go through this experience, not only just listen, but observe and kind of take take stock and engage and part of my way of being in that space is also to make it very clear like we are we are in, I am sharing the space with you and so like as things kind of arise we're resolving them in real time and then we're also resolving them kind of future thinking right is to not really actually become fixed or rigid I mean buildings are fixed and rigid right but they should be constructed with the idea that flexibility for the things that we don't know so that they can accommodate at least what we can kind of envision what we don't know, <laughs> if that makes any sense, right? So that always, the institution has to be as fluid and flexible as the people that we work with and create a space where people can tell us the truth, I think is really important and feel safe to tell us the truth. And and I think for, for me and this project that we're doing with uh, Assets for Artists and Mass Mocha with Converging Liberations is that 
we we don't have right we don't have the land we don't have the resources um we are partnering with a place that does um feeling the tension throughout this entire project of what that means is like three black artists going into mass mocha trying to dream into a non-transactional residency of a place that if folks want to come and sleep for the entire time that that's something that they can do that like rest and nourishment is something that is important especially for BIPOC and QT BIPOC folks that we're like thinking and expanding the ways outside of like the normal parameters of like fine arts or performance arts of who is even like able to be in this space uh, making it accessible and realistic to folks who have family or who have like accessibility needs and not charging them to be there and recognizing like folks like during a residency, they are losing income. So like, how can we like minimize some of these barriers that have been in place for many, many years that keep some people and allow some people to go and attend residencies, not only because of like their economic status or like their social capital, but also because like they have they have that time and they have like the connections that that makes. So like, I think for, for us, like in planning converging liberations is like, how do we then break some of these things? And we are going to be reproducing things. Like this is a perfectly imperfect, right? We are, we're doing our best and we're not going to make everything happen. We um, had lots of community conversations with artists all throughout Massachusetts and helped and that helped us like inform kind of how we are doing this kind of first iteration, but this is iterative. Like this has to be something that we continue to like build, reflect, revise, create, build, reflect, revise, create. And feelings are important. I think feelings, you know, um, and, and trust and building relationship is important because that's how then people can actually tell you the truth um, as well as like just like, you know, what we're observing from one another being in space or being uncomfortable in space or having to perform ourselves in space because of whatever the, the obligations are or the expectations are. And so I think really like intentionally like reimagining how we're thinking about being in nature and being in, in relationship with new people in in a new space for many times uh, for many folks, like is, could be like really generative, could be as long as like we are thinking and feeling and moving in relationship to the folks who are there as, as creative people. So I, I wanna kind of add to the conversation that you're having from a, an invitation from the audience. And that is, so we're specifically talking about kind of QT BIPOC artists and artist residencies. So I also, and, and Bashizo, you brought up other kinds of identities in creating these environments in terms of accessibility. Um, so how does age then impact the BIPOC artist and artist residencies? So sometimes, so I'm suggesting that we often have a picture in our head when we think about a BIPOC artist. And, and it's a limited age range. Yeah, I think for us, we really tried to like expand um, and um, not only to like different generations, but also like proximity, um, and whether or not they've actually ever had a residency, whether or not they've actually ever had a show, whether or not they are even legible in like traditional ways are the, are the, are the ways in which we've kind of like centered and anchored our, our approach to, to converging liberations residency. And while like hoping to build like a multi-generational residency where folks can gather together, because I don't think that that's only like something that's missing in kind of like arts and culture, but in like a lot of places in society where folks become erased or invisibilized for multiple reasons. and elders being one of those um, locations, bodies, beings in which that happens. And to imagine like, 
you know, a land steward or, a, or an organizer or a historian or, you know, a dynamic mat, like a uh, stripper pole, like dancer, like these are folks who we are actually inviting into this space, into, into like being in relationship with one another and their practice in a way that doesn't have to subscribe to traditional fine arts, performing arts, like, like categories. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a theme I'm hearing around continue, continuing to talk about this idea of artist centered and what we mean by that um, and, in the, and, and trust. And so I'm curious if other panelists and, 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 and conversants want to kind of contribute to this notion of, are we really talking about trust um, and the conditions for trust? Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I, one of the things that I have felt to be really important to residency work is as a curator to like continue showing up and being really, really present all the time so that I can try and like, you know, micromanage everything. Um, but, you know, from the sidelines, leaving space, but really being, being in the room, not just in the planning of something, but as it's going on in order to help be a liaison and a facilitator um, between artists and our staff. Um, and a lot of that is like spending a lot of time with folks before a residency even starts and building personal relationships. Um, but when it comes down to it, you know, I, I hold the power and um, I think, you know, like COVID-19 has, has really crystallized this power relationship because, um, you know, I'm thinking of like particular examples of um, premieres that had to be canceled, contracts that had to be rewritten, um, money that had to be shifted. And I, I really want to bring finances and money into the conversation. That's such a big part of this. And I think Bashizo mentioned like funding at some point, fully funded artist residencies where people are being paid a living wage to be in the place that they're at, where everyone who's involved is being paid equitably, um, where technical collaborators are not being paid a lot more than other types of collaborators. Um, these are really important things. And when we're building personal relationships with folks built on trust, that is important. But, but one of the other things that is important is then also making room for that business relationship, because sometimes that holds more care, I think, than a sort of like false hope toward trust. Um, you know, we can have lots of conversations over the phone and that's really, really important, but sometimes actually the thing that holds more weight is a formal letter from me as, an, as a member of an institution that, that is a legal document um, or from my director or from the university, right? Actually not from me. Um, and so I think that trust is a really complicated thing here because while I sort of jokingly say that like, no, we're not dealing in terms of trust. Of course, I hope that we are and we can. Um, it's also, you know, I think we have to be aware that, that those trusting relationships also um, sometimes need to look really different. And sometimes that trust is me truly wearing the institution identity and owning that and taking responsibility for it um, and, and acting accordingly, if that, if that makes sense. I, I, wanna, I, I wanna piggyback off of what um, Bashizo is saying and Ashley is saying, because there's, so there's so many parts of this that um, bleed into other areas. But at the end of the day, to me, it is the responsibility of the institution to own the commitment they are making to the artist. And as an institution, you need to represent what it is you're committed to because that reflects what you're going to do. So when we talked about this idea of being ready for, or, or, or the truth, is the institution ready for the truth? Even if you told them what it was you needed or what was required, is the institution ready for that? Um, you know, and I, and I, I think also we're talking about what, 
what folks see on the outside and what happens internally. But what happens internally reflects what is seen on the outside ultimately, and it will manifest with what we do on the inside. I think um, to Ashley's point, relationships are key. And then that goes back to structurally, what does, what does the staff look like? Because Ashley is probably spending a lot of time trying to make sure everyone feels comfortable, but it's going to be exceptionally difficult if the artist in the room is the only person who might look different or has, I mean, it's just, it's these, I think it's basic things that we just need to think about and build on. It's very simple, but it's a hard, it's a hard thing to tackle because we're talking about what, what brought us all here together is what does accountability look like in this? What, what are we saying as institutions? And to be genuine and real and truthful about the extent to which we are able to deal with the truth starting internally. And I think also what I'm hearing with this is even in the midst of what we create, when we start to redefine, we're illuminating even more inequity and more issues and in that it's like this continual snowball that can seem overwhelming to the extent for me i'm always most concerned with how are we going to stay vigilant to go back to what but she's always saying during um during their introduction is it it will something new will come and shadow, put this in the shadow, and then we will go back through a cycle, and when we will come here again, and sometimes we forget that we've been here. So I, I know I said a lot there, but imagine, I think all of us have been in, in a situation where we felt that, this sort of urgency to, is this the one I'm going to focus on? Is this the battle I'm going to, you know, go for, or am I going to do this in order to get that? And I think that's what we're all really struggling with in order to serve our artists. It just seems like a lot. Sarah? All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think all of this work, in order for it to be sustainable and substantive, and sometimes sometimes it's frustrating in that it has to sometimes be incremental, right? It is, it's kind of a time-based practice and as you said, you as soon as you start looking, what, as soon as you feel like you've made some progress in run one area, it illuminates what you're missing in an area that you didn't even think of, right? And so I think kind of, you know, I've had the benefit of being at Skowhegan for 11 years, right? And so like the, the kind of process-based building of all of this kind of shift is is something that you have to give yourself time for. You have to give your time for like dealing with the money in changing how, all right, well, now you've changed how you evaluate work through an admissions process. Now, what do you need to do to accommodate all of these different kinds of individuals that are now going to be in this space? So it is an iterative, slow, incremental process, but that's what's going to point to its sustainability in some way. And just back to the question of trust, you know, I mean, I think it's really important what Ashley was saying about, look, in order for people in an art context to also feel like they can do the work that they need to do, they need to know that somebody is holding the frame, I guess, is really important. And that is attached to any number of areas, whether it's kind of like personal identity based or creative in some ways and right and so like all of the work that we all are doing to kind of change our relative institutions should really be about us kind of solidifying the space so that people can really push the boundaries that they need to push and part of that is them tr trusting us so that they can trust them themselves to take risks and to beyond what they've been a lot of people have been told they're capable of doing, you know, I mean, that alone is a really important part of that experience as well, right? Changing a relationship, a previous relationship with institutions. So, so there are a couple thank you. I feel like I said a lot. No, no, there's a couple questions coming in from the audience that's really specific to the container, right? That the artist residency is a container. And we're specifically talking about the experiences of QT BIPOC 
artists within those containers. Um, and we specifically invited you all as panelists because the environments in which your residencies are located are very different, right? So the two questions that are interconnected, one is about the system, the other is about um, uh, BIPOC folks within the environment. And so one is around um, creating uh, safety, which I think um, you've answered some of that already in, in some way. Um, but the other is around um, kind of whiteness, right, as the identity of the institution, but also as a steward, what are you doing to create those conditions? And so I've heard Ashley talk about relationships. Um, the second part of this question from the audience is around this invitation, right, to increase people of colors, artists' interest to come to these experiences and these spaces. And what and what's the responsibility and accountability around um, turning someone's experience into promotional material for fodder for your institution? Um, again, for me, this goes back to trust. But if anybody wants to speak to um, the potential impact or harm in that work, both from being a predominantly white institution or in your um, invitation to artists of color to be in your environments. The other piece I wanna bring up that came from the audience is around also colorism in that invitation um, and how, um, you know, uh, the, the intersection of both having a BIPOC experience, but also, um, they use the phrase white passing, which I, which is hard for me to kind of ingest because passing is a choice. Um, so um, what it means for a person of color to be read by a white institution um, as a preference, as a participant in a residency. So I, I, what I really hear them saying is, um, you know, the art world attracts, right? There's certain things that we want to have in our spaces um, as investments. So we're using artist residencies as investments for those institutions. So I don't know if any of that makes sense to you or resonates, but you can you can respond to whatever part of that yet you find meaning in. I'll go there. I'll go there a little bit. Um, I think that idea of, of promotional material. Um, I, I think, you know, I think of like Cognate Collective, who we just had in residence for five years. You know, it's those long-term residencies that build relationships, and and thinking about the, you know, not the walls of the institution being the barrier that our whole region can be where the residency takes place. So it can take place at swap meets or it can take place at the border crossing or it can take place wherever the, the, the work or the inspiration leaves the artist. Um, but then the documentation, you know, is a, a publication that, you know, putting the artist at the forefront, having them at every meeting with the designer, having them at every conversation about the text, having them with every conversation about the translation. So it is not just a promotional material, but this is, this is how they, want to be perceived in the world um, and their voice is I mean it's very clear the the aesthetic of the catalog is definitely not you know what I would design at all because I want it to feel they will I would, it's their catalog it's not my catalog it's not our institution catalog this is their document um, and then how it gets distributed you know we build a, a mailing list and we mail it for free to you know a thousand individuals because it's not about the consumerism of that object. It's about the, the distribution of that information to individuals that they really want to have that publication in their hands. Uh, so, you know, as we were budgeting for that publication, it was really budgeting for what it costs to mail, you know, 1100 catalogs for free, um, what, what their mailing list was, what our mailing list was, where it needed to go and having conversations about every person on that list so that there was an understanding of how this could 
potentially benefit them in the future for other you know, possible residencies, possible projects, possible engagement, um, the future of their livelihood. So I think, you know, I don't think of it as promotional. I think it more is, is documentation of their process and their practice. I mean, I can say, you know, um, again, because I sort of centered myself within this canister of whiteness, which I very much work within, um, I think that what I hear, Carmen, coming up in your question is also, a, you know, tokenism, which is happening a lot right now, and what it, what kind of value it brings to the institution to program you know, black artists in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and, and how white institutions are benefiting from that and what that looks like. And it's something that I'm really struggling with. I don't know the answer. Um, I think it's really important to, to just keep it like extremely present all of the time um, and figure out what that looks like moving forward. I think that also, you know, noticing what institutions have been doing and are doing now, how shifts are happening and who's behind them, um, what kind of funding and like money support are going behind them. Um, and also, you know, radically re-envisioning, you know, I really wanna call into the space, the Creating New Futures group, which is a group of artists located within the dance community who've been doing a lot of radical activist work on the artist side to show institutions what to do because they saw it mishandled so drastically um, in the wake of COVID and in the wake of, of the murder of, of Joy, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and, and others. Um, and so, you know, I think that artists are having to do a lot of labor right now to show institutions how to not do this in the wrong way. Um, and then as, as a white institution, again, it's about staffing, it's about doing work in, on the inside um, so that it's not just these external empty, um, you know, gestures, <laughs> but that, that there's actual work happening there. And again, like I said earlier, I just, it, it, it is really hard for me to see where this can like truly happen without, as Erica was saying, a radical shift in staffing without, you know, having QT BIPOC folks at the actual top, um, not at the bottom being underpaid and doing the work on staff. Um, and so also things like unionizing staff um, is really important, which I know is a big conversation at Masmoka right now, or, you know, different, different types of efforts at at every single level of the institution and in every single way in our community. And then recognizing that a lot of this work is happening outside of the institution without institutional support. And so how do we recognize that and how can funders um, you know, focus funding toward artists sometimes and not institutions actually, so that those, those artists don't have to be dependent on um, institutional vision <laughs> and deliverable and representation and what that looks like. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard to be artist centered when we're talking about all these conditional challenges of an institution that we're privileging. You know, um, you know, I think about um, as an artist, how easy it is to move from our intention around centering the artist to navigating around what we are aware of is absent in the institutions we're working in. And for me, that's a real tension. But as the artist, it's not my responsibility, you know? And so I'm curious about, you know, our commitments as hosts, right? Hosting artists, you know, in these environments, as John pointed out, to temporarily, right, create these conditions that the artist is asking for while they are present. Um, and I just wanna put a small kind of input in for us to think about it from a systems perspective. You know, we're talking about the art world, we're talking about 
arts and culture institutions. We're talking about the artist residency as institution. We're talking about systems of oppression. We're talking about the individual artist experience and all of those things are dynamic. Um, and what is our capacity to create trust at every level of system? Um, Louise Diamond um, developed what she called the four levels of trust. And I've heard you all name each level at some point in this conversation. The first level is, I trust you mean me no harm. The second is that I trust you understand my interest. The third is that I trust that you want to see my interests satisfied. And the fourth is that you will represent my interests even if I'm not present. So the audience is pushing you, John, in particular around what does it mean to honor the work of the artist and yet in the invitation to bring in the sheriff, you know, in your example that you gave in your introduction, um, that the combination of both the systems programming and the individual artist's desires still don't then land as a promotional visual, you know? So both what the artist wants, but the subjectivity of how the environment's taking it in is, is really the kind of push that I, I heard. Um, but all of that, uh, again, what are, we, what, what are our commitments to really being responsible to these conditions or every thread of condition? And I say with bringing Sheriff Joe in, you mm -hmm. know, this, this was a decision that was made by the artist. He wanted to bring Sheriff Joe yes. in because um, it was agreed that there was only talking points going out into community from both, both sides. Uh, and it was the idea that this is the person that is the decision maker on incarceration in Phoenix. And if we don't bring him in, like he'd have been invited to the campus before and he would go, he'd get booed off campus and there's no conversation. And then he goes to his press because he's got really good control of the press in Phoenix. And he gives a press conference talking about, you know, the liberal people over there, they don't understand. So we wanted to make this project about civil discourse. How do you have a civil conversation with people that you adamantly disagree with? How do you bring different perspectives? So we were bringing both the, the people that were incarcerated and the, the militarization of the police force into the museum. So there was weapons, there was the, the people that were currently incarcerated during public hours of the museum. We wanted to make it very visible and, and have access to people that were you know, in, in the system currently. But at the same time, we were bringing anybody that wanted to sign up over to Tent City to experience it themselves, to say like, what is the reality? We hear it all on TV, we hear about the pink underwear, we hear about the tents, let's go experience this so that we're not just ill-informed based on news talking points, but we have firsthand knowledge of what's happening in our own community. And I think that's what the artist was about. The space was open to anybody that wanted to have meetings uh, that were involved with incarceration in any way, shape or form. So at that table with Sheriff Joe, were also people from Amnesty International, people from prison rights groups. Uh, there was um, formerly incarcerated individuals, parents of people that were currently incarcerated. So it was very much this, it was a big table with people and people from his own office, Sheriff Joe's office, all at this table. And then the audience was surrounding it. So it started as a dialogue at the table and then went out to community. Um, you know, and, and, and then you start to discover like the number two number three person at the office is totally in alignment with our thinking. And she's working from the inside to try to change things. And you realize this is this amazing human that we would have never known about and who'd become a complete ally for us. Yeah, and I think that it's great learning and it still pushes the question of what does it mean to support the artist's experiment even if the design is flawed in some way as the host, as the residency host. And I would follow that up by saying, well, that was a successful project. We have completely failed artists. Um, we had an artist that we, we had known for years. Um, they went off, they had worked for us at one point, they went off and got education at different institutions. And then we said, oh, we should bring you back. And, and they were transitioning and um, 
that we've, we thought together and had beautiful conversations beforehand about the idea of what it means to open up a transition period and watch, you know, and experience this transition through a, a person that's transitioning their eyes. And I think our institution wasn't ready. I think, you know, me and my team weren't fully prepared as we thought we were. Um, I think the artist wasn't fully prepared because, you know, there's things that happen when you transition. There's things that happen in an institution that's not prepared. And it, it completely fell apart. And unfortunately, you know, we, it left on horrible terms. And, and those are the projects that break my heart. And I'm trying to rebuild those relationships and say, okay, how can we learn from that? How can we learn from you? Can we rebuild that relationship and move forward in our institution in more successful ways? Um, because we have a history of showing transgender artists. We have this deep history of work, having transgender employees working for us. But we failed this artist, and I, I, you know, we have to figure out why that is, and how we don't do that in the future, and how we try to help any harm that we have created to this individual by that experience. Um, you know, it's it's we we failed. I mean, that's that's no other way to say it. We failed on that project. We have a, you know numerous of those failures that we are trying to figure out how to resolve those situations. Um, even with our staffing, you know, we, we have a very diverse staff, but when COVID hit, you know, there was lower staff and there was upper staff and my budget isn't tied to our institutional budget. It's like this really weird system where if I even I gave up my whole salary, it couldn't go to them. So how do we figure out these budgets in a bigger way and not lay off as, you know, we tried to hold as long as we could, but yeah, it's tough. I just want to, I, I was thinking about where, what you were saying, Carmen, and this going back to this idea of um, being artist centered. And we've talked a lot about what institutions are trying to do to serve, you know, be artist centered. But I, I, I know we don't have a lot of times probably a different conversation, but we haven't even talked about why artists come to these residencies. You know, we have to understand there is a motivation, there is a need, and different residencies pose different um, opportunities, expectations, needs. And that, I mean, that's that, and that is a lot of what it means to be centered. I mean, you know, for for me, I I created a space in where I could do one-on-one. -on -one, so that allows me a lot of flexibility. And I do, I I it's very important for me. To develop a relationship, but you know, um, you know, someone else's residency, it's different, and I think that that we need to acknowledge that too. That I mean, even the the idea, and I think a couple of folks have it, but access to a residency. Don't be fooled that everybody gets to participate in a residency, and I think Bashizo talked about that, and I think what Bashizo is doing as redefining or expanding what we define as artists or creatives in order to participate, which means you have to change the conditions in which you can participate. Again, opening that larger can of words, but I just, I wonder, um, I just don't want that to be overlooked because that's a large part of this. Not everybody wants it, not everybody needs it, not everybody can do it. It is, it is part of the art world, the art industry complex that we've talked about that also feeds this and has created this. And I just think we need to acknowledge that from the perspective of the artists coming into it too. So yes, uh, just to join Erica, we have about 20 minutes left of our time together. And so, you know, we kind of in our prep talked about what do we need to say to the audience that's missing about um, artist residencies and race. And specifically, um, we had a commitment to each other that we would name those things as a, as a panel, as a community. So this is your time. I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure I can totally answer that. Um, I think 
there's a lot missing, right? I mean, I think that that's probably the first place to start and kind of to speak to what John was saying and Ashley and, and all of us, you know, I mean, we are also all humans, right? And there are gonna be mistakes and, you know, to go to your questions of trust, you can, you can abide by all of the, that four levels of trust and still make a mistake, right? And particularly in this, in this moment right now, I think where there's rightfully, this is the conversation that we need to be having. But I think one of the things that I've learned over time in being at Skowhegan is like, we need to also acknowledge the fact that we have all spent a lot of time away from each other and we don't know how to be with each other. And even when you're well-intentioned that it's just like not part of how we exist in, in certainly in this country, definitely in the world, you know, like there are a lot of barriers that are structural and unseen and really intentionally keep us apart from each other and make these processes really difficult. And so when we start to do that work, it's, it's slow, it's mistake ridden, it can be harmful, it can go the wrong direction, um, but that I guess is not a reason to not do the work and not to stop, right? Um, that's maybe all I can say about the, in there's a lot missing. <laughs> yeah, um, agreed. I think there's a lot missing. I think, you know, it's one of those things that when you, as we've spoken about it, when we start to scratch at a thing or try to resolve a thing, five other things like become um, appear and emerge. And I think for me, one of the things that I'm hoping you know, my presence here means is that um, folks feel like they can create these spaces outside of institutions. Um, and, you know, this, this iteration of converging liberations residency is in partnership right now with Mass Mocha, but ideally that's not really where we want to be. Um, we want to be on a farm somewhere, some BIPOC farm where like, we get to be in relationship with ourselves and the land and and just like the artistry of cultivation um, and all the different ways in which that can kind of like express itself um, while also dealing with the tension like the only reason why we could have gotten this off the ground is because bar and mass mocha was like we want to support BIPOC artists. What do what do you, what does that look like? And we were like, it looks like a free, fully funded residency, and where folks don't have any deliverables, where folks who never who live five minutes, ten minutes away from Mass Mocha can actually be in that space and feel welcomed in that space. Um, and and we're we're kind of like stumbling through this whole process um, and. And happily stumbling and you know when we make a mistake and when we do harm we really try to center just as much like care as like reparations like we try to be like we are accountable to this this fuck up this thing and and we'll try in real time to fix it and also like in how we're thinking about perhaps the second or third or fourth iteration like how we can do it because not only are we limited because we are three people who have never done this shit before, but we're also limited by the institution and like the way in which that is yielding and unyielding to, to the types of like changes and transformations that we are trying to bring into this space. And so like I'm hoping and, and it's already happening and it's been happening and that folks are thinking like beyond like a particular type of pipeline, a particular type of trajectory in terms of their creative careers and really like taking the time and being vulnerable enough to like vision into and dream into like what what does that actually look like for you and not everybody is going to be on a particular track like I am not all all those rejection letters <laughs> from residencies and from grants and wherever really helped to like solidify like actually this is my problems in grad school 
um, this is actually not where I need to be. This is not where I can thrive. This is not my audience. This is not my interest. So let me like instead pivot instead of being always fighting with some bullshit, like pivot and think about like what it is that I want and what it is that I need and what are the folks I'm in relationship to want and need and how can we create that mutually together? even during a fucking pandemic, right? Like it's crazy, <laughs> um, but we're trying, we're trying to do this thing and we're making mistakes. And, but just the fact that we are trying to do this acknowledges all of the systems and structures and violence and recognizes like, like how we want to not only like protect ourselves, but to protect members of our community, even if we don't know their names. So we're not like throwing people's pictures up and we're not, we're, we are really like very protective of like how, how we're trying to go about this, this project and this initial project in a way that feels not only like trustworthy, but like responsible. Um, and yeah, and that's all I got. Right. Yeah. Can you all kind of also add the community where your residencies are cited as a part of this conversation and um, how do you see your responsibilities to, in terms of inviting this artist into your, uh, or the artist into your communities, your neighborhoods, and, you know, the power dynamics that are present in that? Yeah, I think real quickly for us is we're trying to create kind of like a, a green book guide, right, um, that says and locates places where folks are not going to feel different or um, in danger or whatever. And, and to use like the folks and have this, this green book be informed by the people who actually are in North Adams and the Berkshires to, to help like get us, give us this information for us to share. Because there we know that the, the community outside of Mass Mocha may have some different politics, may have some different behaviors, may have some different ideas of what, who and shouldn't, who and should not be there. And we, we're trying to, you know, create a, a, a navigational strategic system for people um, when they come, all the guys be willing <laughs> in the summer so that some of some like some of the pressure of being in all white spaces, rural spaces can be minimized. We're not gonna get rid of all of them, but we are attempting to like think beyond actually just the land itself of, of or the property of Mass Mocha, but like how are folks going to be engaging? Where are they gonna be getting food? Where are they going to be getting supplies? Where are they gonna be getting weed? Where, like whatever it is that they need, like how do we create like ways to make that easier for people to get what they need while they're there? Would anyone like to also flip that and think about the role of the artist as a power role and what it means for the artist to enter the community and the materiality of a, of a new environment for the artist, even an artist of color. I, I would go back to Cognate Collective and the way they kind of picked apart the community by being here. So, you know, they have garage sale weekend. So our community, we're located in a downtown center uh, that is going through gentrification, has been going through gentrification for many years. They dropped an art center here in 1999 as, you know, the arts bringing economic development to an area that's, that's perceived as abandoned. Um, but the community is, is rich with um, what by census style, Chep Mark says Hispanic, but I would say, you know, mostly Mexican immigrants undocumented, uh, El Salvador, um, Guatemala, or some Colombia, uh, a mix of amazing culture here. And, uh, you know, they, they have garage sale weekends here and you start to say, oh, that's great. It's, you know, economics, people can come in for garage sale weekends and everybody comes to Santa Ana, it's four times a month. And then when you start to break that down, you realize that's an economic, um, uh, it's a way to control economies because people that are undocumented oftentimes repurpose items and sell those. And that's the economy that's driven through the community. And so 
Cognit starts pulling that apart and saying like, look, this policy is really detrimental to people that live in this community because there's no in income coming in. You know, th this is a way to make cash. It's a cash economy. And when you limit it to four times a, a year, you've really limited what that economic input can be. Um, so the project starts to explore those ideas and starts to explore marketplace and starts to explore swap meets and starts to explore the border transitions and where things are coming from. And it all kind of explodes from there uh, and starts to change systems. And so then you start to look at government policies and say, okay, you can't have garage sales, but you can have what they call swap meets in locations as long as they don't occur the same place every location. So how do you transition them and create this structure so that economies can go back to the way they were? So you know, they, it, it empowers artists in a way to kind of connect with the community and start exploring. And they, they were prime examples. I mean, they're just amazing, amazing. Amy Sanchez and Misal Diaz are just two of the most incredible artists I've ever met. So, um, yeah. Did you raise your hand, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think our, our, participant body at Skowhegan is 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 very different than the town the bodies of the people in town that we live with um you know rural where we are in rural Maine is you know has a lot of economic disadvantage advantages industry is left there's not a lot of jobs um it is I, I grew up in Baltimore it's kind of the rural ver equivalent of inner city Baltimore in terms of opportunity and and kind of resources poured into school and health resources and things like that. It's a real community of, of economic lack and potential in, in certain respects in that um, to change the conditions that are there. And so that, you know, it's there's not a it's a pretty heterogeneous community. Um, you know, I think in the last election they voted like 85% Trump. You know, so it's a big difference from the individuals that come from all over the world to arrive at Skowhegan. And I think what's been really important to me is also figuring out ways to not flatten that community and also not have our community flattened when we're in space together and really making sure that there is some context for people to understand and the landscape in which we're, we are located and understanding the economics and the education and kind of the familiarity with people not from that area and some of those, um, some of the conditions that confine their lives that are not that dissimilar than the ways our lives are confined if you're QT uh, BIPOC in the outside world and trying to make relationships in that respect. And then also just being like, be the person that is, is not willing to tolerate when something goes wrong. You know, I know every police officer in that town or like, or, you know, I know the neighbors and I know where to go. So some of it's like through my kind of consistent presence and, and being a good neighbor when it's not the responsibility of the artists that come through Skowhegan to be the good neighbor, it's Skowhegan's responsibility to be the good neighbor. And so setting up the dynamic in that way, you know, um, we had an artist come that was with us from Lebanon, a queer artist, and he really wanted to make a video work at a gun shop. And so, you know, we got in the car and we drove from gun shop to gun shop. And I was just, I was scared. He was scared. You know, we didn't, but he eventually found the gun shop that was willing to really welcome him into their space and participate in this wild project. And so there's potential when it doesn't feel like there's potential or when you're scared of potential, but sometimes you just need somebody to, this is when the, the institution carries a little heft and you take it out on the road. <laughs> anyway, so. Thank you, Sarah. You know, we need to close out our time um, with each other. And I just wanna invite you to close yourself out um, in a way that feels meaningful to you. Um, but I also wanna invite you to maybe share a learning that you got from one of the other panelists as a way to complete yourself. And anyone can begin.
I can begin. Um, first, thanks to you all so much. Um, I have to say that we're in a Zoom meeting together and we actually don't see the comments. I feel like that's worth mentioning to the audience. Um, Carmen asked us to turn off our own self view, which has been rel revelatory for me personally all week, <laughs> learning that feature of Zoom. Um, but it has been nice, I just have to say, to be in what feels like a little bit of a more intimate space with you all throughout this. Um, and I, I just really appreciate your presence and getting to talk with you um, through this. And yeah, I mean, I think I have to say, you know, Bashizo, I've really appreciated your perspective um, within this frame as an artist who is often working outside of institutions, but also has, as someone who's coming to Mass Mocha and working with the community. Um, I have to say that to speak to Carmen's last point about what when is the artist, even a BIPOC artist in an institution in a position of power in relation to the community, this is something that I see play out at MPAC all the time. Um, and because of where we are situated within a university setting and the relationship between MPAC and that university to our extremely vibrant community of local artists in particular, and the ways in which we don't necessarily always serve that community. Um, but, but Shizo, I feel like I have really, you know, learned a lot from these conversations, especially because of our geographic proximity to Mass Mocha. And I just really look forward to having you in this area and hope that, uh, can't wait to come this summer and, and see the work and I'm sending all the energies and I'm here as a resource as well. So thank you. And, and truly like, thanks to each of you individually, because this has been wonderful and I can't wait to continue the conversations far beyond this little Zoom meetup that we have here. So thank you. I, I would agree with what Ashley said in terms of what we've learned from Bashizo as an artist here um, and his perspective, but also uh, Carmen and your way of listening and understanding has really informed me. Um, you just you just bring a presence and um, and a way of listening to the questions and listening to the conversation that bring important points forward. So thank you for being such an amazing moderator. Um, and yeah, that's. I'm just honored to be in a Zoom room with all of you. So thank you. I can go next. Um, I think when we had our planning session, we talked about being able to bring vulnerability to this space. So I just want to express my gratitude to all of you for, for doing that tonight and to Carmen for facilitating that. Um, a different way of, of interacting for all of us. Um, I also wanna say thank you to Billy while we're on here. <laughs> yeah, I think and feel um, like this is a pause um, that this is a conversation that I'm happy that is happening now but I wish was happening 10, 20 years, 30 years ago. And I hope like in the next 10, 20 years, 30 years, it doesn't happen. Like we are in a different place. Um, kind of going back to Erica's point about what I understood to be historical amnesia. Um, and, and, and there does feel like there's a slight like bit of, of hope in there for me. I'm often very suspicious uh, of institutions and even of calls and conversations like this and was really like nervous and like, you know, um, but I feel like I was able to show up as myself and, and imperfect and messy and, you know, um, and I appreciate that, uh, that y'all were able to be with me here and that I was able to be with you um, as well. And that, you know, folks really took to heart, like kind of our first, our first uh, desires of like how we wanted to be in space and that we were able to manifest that from all of these different perspectives. Um, and Carmen, thank you for holding this container as well as you did the first time we met and this time um, and Billy for, one, look and fly, <laughs> and two, <laughs> for all the hard work um, 
uh, interpreting this. Like it's a, yeah, super grateful for this space and for this conversation. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll add how I ended the last conversation we all had together. I am in complete and utter gratitude to all of you for, again, um, taking the time, uh, truly making yourselves vulnerable and being honest. Um, we're, in a, we're in a period where I think a lot of us feel a lot of fear at different times of the day, even, for, for various reasons. And it is in that fear that you're able to be honest and show truth. Um, and that takes a lot of courage. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody for being so, uh, so courageous uh, this evening. And, you know, I think when Carmen says, what do we want to take away from this? That, you know, in this sense of urgency that we feel right now, we need to acknowledge that this is a marathon and we need to uh, always continue uh, to, to do the work, but give ourselves um, time to process or even to take a break so that we can continue it. Um, I think, you know, what our residence is that I, I think a lot of us share tonight, it is about self-care. And that includes the people that actually <laughs> do the work in these residencies, as well as those that we that we host and serve. So um, on, on behalf of MCLA and BCRC and Mass Voca, I also want to thank all of you for participating. I think Laura and I, after this, will be quite giddy because we this is what we have been looking for and we hope to continue to do, and we could not do it without um, any of you. So thank you, Laura and Carmen and Sarah and Bashizo and John and Ashley and Billy and Lillian too, uh, for all that you've done uh, this evening. And thanks to all of you who have joined us. Um, it has been a pleasure and an honor. Um, just to close out, the community is sharing their gratitude in the chat box. And I wanted to share that with you all. And I'm grateful that we were together and that you trusted me enough to be with you this evening. So for that, we are complete for now. <laughs>